Hello everyone and welcome back to the Dungeon Learner's Guide. Today we have another Commander's Guild deck tech. This one is affectionately titled Pet Cemetery. And if you haven't seen this series before, what we are doing is we are selecting a card from scryfall.com, working with a budget of $100 or less, and building a commander deck for Magic the Gathering around a theme of the chosen card. So this week's card is... Cursed Monstrosity. It's four and a black for a 4-3 horror creature. Uh, it's got flying, and whenever it becomes the target of a spell or ability, sacrifice it unless you discard a land card from your hand. So, not a particularly great body for what it is. It does fly, which is great. And it has a bit of a downside, because whenever it's the target of a spell or ability, we either have to sacrifice it or discard a land neither of which we really want to be doing. So what I decided to do was go with the theme of it possibly being in the graveyard a little bit more than we want, and we're going to focus a little bit on its creature type, horror. Now, to that end, I wanted to pick a commander that dealt with both of those themes. Unfortunately, I couldn't quite find one that did both. So instead, we went with Moldrotha the Gravetide to deal with the graveyard side of its abilities. And this is three black, green, blue for a legendary creature elemental avatar. It's a 6-6. Six, six. And during each of our turns, we may play up to one permanent card of each permanent type from our graveyard. So the Curse Monstrosity wants to be in our graveyard. Well, it doesn't want to be in our graveyard, but it's probably going to be in our graveyard. So Moldrotha is going to help us recast it. Or we can discard land cards to keep it around and then replay the lands from the graveyard. So that is our main goal here. Otherwise, we do have some themes that tie this deck together. The first one is horrors. We're actually a bit of a horror tribal deck. So to that end, we have something like Thing in the Ice, which is one in a blue. For a horror, it's a 0-4 defender. Thing in the Ice enters the battlefield with four ice counters on it. And whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, we remove an ice counter from Thing in the Ice. Then, if it has no ice counters on it, transform it. And when it transforms, it turns into Awoken Horror, which is a 7-8. And when it transforms into Awoken Horror, you return all non-horror creatures to their owner's hands. So, as far as I'm aware... This is the only card that actually references horrors as a creature type. There's no lord effects. There's no all your horrors get menace or death touch. This is the only thing that really gives us a benefit for playing horror tribal. So to that end, it is a super nice card to have in this deck. And it's also going to be a great one-sided board wipe if we can ever get it to flip. Our second theme is going to be wheel effects, things that take cards in our hand and put them into our graveyard. So we have Whispering Madness, which is two blue black for a sorcery that says each player discards his or her hand, then draws cards equal to the greatest number of cards a player discarded this way, and it has Cypher. So when we cast it and it resolves, we can exile it encoded onto a creature we control. Then when that creature deals combat damage to a player, we can cast a copy of Whispering Madness. So in theory, we could cast Whispering Madness, wheel away everybody's hands, put it on a creature that is hard to block, immediately hit some of our opponents, and then wheel everybody again. Hopefully messing up our opponents as we go, but more importantly, filling up our graveyard, which with Moldrotha is basically like an extension of our hand. And then our final theme is, of course, playing cards from our graveyard. So Moldrotha, of course, cares about cards in our graveyard, but there's a surprising number of horrors that are the same. So, for example, we have Laboratory Drudge, which is three and a blue for a zombie horror, three, four. At the beginning of each end step, we draw a card if we've cast a spell from a graveyard or activated an ability of a card in a graveyard this turn. So we're able to cast something with Moldrotha, move to our end step with Laboratory Drudge, and draw a card. And there's quite a few cards that care about us messing around with our graveyard. This is just one example. Now, with our themes out of the way, I do want to take a look at some key cards, three in particular. The first one is Forgotten Creation. 
3 and a blue for a zombie horror, a 3-3 three, three with skulk, so it can't be blocked by creatures with greater power, and at the beginning of our upkeep, we may discard all the cards in our hand, and if we do, we draw that many cards. So Forgotten Creation is a one-sided wheel effect every single turn. As long as we can keep this thing on the board, we are able to pitch our hand every single turn and draw a new one, which with Moldrotha means that we're basically just drawing additional cards because Moldrotha lets us cast spells out of our graveyard. We have things like Laboratory Drudge that want us to be casting things out of our graveyard. We have horrors that can bring themselves back out of our graveyard. So Forgotten Creation is an absolute all-star in this deck. Our next card, Mirror Shield. So this kind of represents a whole host of cards in this deck, but I, I personally love Mirror Shield, so I do want to highlight it. It is two mana for an artifact, equipment. Equipped creature gets plus O, plus two, has hexproof, and whenever a creature with death touch blocks or becomes blocked by this creature, destroy that creature, and then it has equip two. So the main draw of this card is that it gives us hexproof. We really want Muldrotha on the battlefield to do its thing. So we really need any equipment that can give us Hexproof. So Mirror Shield, Mask of Avacyn, Swift Foot Boots, they're all in here. But Mirror Shield I love in particular because it also has that clause that basically prevents Death Touch creatures from attacking us because if Muldrotha has the Mirror Shield, blocks a Death Touch creature, the Death Touch creature dies before it even gets to do damage. So it's a nice small deterrent if we ever need it, which is a big reason why I love this card. And then finally, our third key card in the deck is everyone's favorite frog horror, the Gitrog Monster. So three black green for a frog horror. Six six death touch. At the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice the Gitrog Monster unless you sacrifice a land. You may play an additional land on each of your turns, and whenever one or more land cards are put into your graveyard from anywhere, draw a card. So we have a lot of expensive cards. Forgotten Creations 4, Gitrog Monster is 5, Muldrotha is 6. We need to be able to ramp pretty well in this deck. And with the way that Muldrotha works, we can play one land a turn out of our graveyard. So Gitrog Monster would trigger... At the beginning of our upkeep, we sacrifice a land, which draws us a card. And then with Muldrotha, we can just replay that land out of our graveyard, plus hopefully an additional land from our hand if we have one. So Gitrog Monster in this deck is almost no downside, and because it's a frog horror, almost all upside for us. And now, with those key cards out of the way, let's take a look at some cool interactions that I found while putting this deck together. The first one is between Woe Strider and Faceless Butcher. Woe Strider is two and a black for a horror, 3-2. When it enters the battlefield, you make a 0-1 white goat creature token, and you can sacrifice another creature to scry one. It also has escape five. You exile four other cards from your graveyard, pay five mana, and you can return it from your graveyard to the battlefield. And if it escapes, it gets an additional two plus one plus one counters. So Woe Strider, also an all-star in this deck. It's got everything. It's a horror. It makes an additional creature. It sacrifices things. It comes back out of the graveyard. It does everything that we want it to do. But if we pair it up with Faceless Butcher, which is two black black for a nightmare horror, it's a 2-3. When it comes into play, remove target creature other than Faceless Butcher from the game, period, when Faceless Butcher leaves play, return the removed card to play under its owner's control. That break-in clause is super important for Faceless Butcher. That means that the removal aspect of it and the return aspect of it are two separate abilities. So if Faceless Butcher comes into play and we target another creature to be exiled, we can then sacrifice it with that ability on the stack, so we sacrifice it to Woe Strider, which then puts the when it leaves play, return the removed card to play under its owner's control ability on the stack. That ability will resolve first, and then the exile ability resolves, meaning that we lose out on Faceless Butcher, but we can permanently exile any creature on the board for two black black. And then with Muldrotha, we can just recast Faceless Butcher and do it again. <laughs> 
So we have a permanent exile effect that is repeatable, that involves a couple of creatures, some sacrificing, and hopefully can deal with pretty much anything on the board. The next interaction we have is between Chasm Skulker and our good friend Forgotten Creation. So Chasm Skulker is two and a blue for a squid horror, 1-1. One, one. Whenever you draw a card, put a plus one, plus one counter on Chasm Skulker. And then when Chasm Skulker dies, we put X-1-1 one, one blue squid creature tokens with Island Walk onto the battlefield, where X is the number of plus one, plus one counters on Chasm Skulker. And then, of course, we have Forgotten Creation again, which is the creature that lets us wheel at the beginning of each of our turns. So with Forgotten Creation on board, if we only have five cards in hand, we're able to discard five cards, draw five on our upkeep, plus the sixth card that we'll draw for turn, immediately putting six plus one plus one counters on Chasm Skulker. If we're able to keep this combination on board for even just two, maybe three turns, Chasm Skulker can be massive very, very quickly. And then even if the Chasm Skulker itself isn't doing a ton of damage, we're able to sacrifice it, get a whole army of little squid tokens, and then with Muldrotha, we can recast Chasm Skulker and just keep the chain going. So hopefully some of our opponents are playing blue, because that's going to let us get in with the island walk squids, but even if they're not, an army of 1-1s is definitely something that is incredibly useful. So with most of the deck tech out of the way, I do want to take a quick look at the price of this deck, which... It came in a little under 90 bucks. It's about $88.77. With the most expensive card actually being quite a surprise to me, it's Hunted Horror, which is a black, black creature horror, 7 7 with Trample. When it comes into play, you put two 3 3 green centaur creature tokens with protection from black into play under target opponent's control. This is a little over $6 for a card that honestly, I don't remember being this expensive, so I was kind of surprised when I saw it. But in Commander, this ability is great. We have a 2-mana 7-7 seven, seven with Trample. We can give one of our opponents two 3-3s. Three, yeah, they've got protection from black. That hurts us a little bit in the long run. But we can give those to someone else and then attack a completely different opponent. So we're able to put a ton of pressure on board really quickly because a 7-7 seven, seven hits hard really early in the game for two mana. And then if we're able to make friends with someone by giving them the tokens, they can also be helping to swing in for six damage at people. So an incredible card in this deck, and I do really want to talk it up because it is a very good card. But I'll be honest... It is the most expensive card in the deck. If you're looking to cut something, you can get this deck down to almost $80 just by cutting this one card. And there are some other sweet horrors that unfortunately didn't make the cut in this deck that you could replace it with. So there's always options. So it's definitely not a necessary include if you don't want it. So now otherwise, we've talked all about the deck, talked about the cool interactions, talked about the deck price. The only thing left to do is to see how this deck functions in an actual game. So we are going to jump into a game with three opponents. We have Teferi, Temporal Archmage, being played by Jason, Tanazir Quandrix, being played by Sean, and Obeka, Brute Chronologist, being played by Bilal. So the Teferi deck is 100% the pre-constructed Teferi deck. Uh, Jason recently purchased this deck and wanted to see how it played directly out of the box before he started to upgrade it and change it. So Teferi is the completely unmodified pre-constructed deck. Um, I personally don't know much about this deck. I would imagine it's very heavy on the control, which might hurt us in the long run. But I do think that having our spells countered isn't necessarily a bad thing because we can just recast them out of the graveyard with Muldrotha. Uh Sean's Tanazir Quandrix deck we've seen on this channel before. It's very powerful, can be very explosive with a lot of plus one, plus one counters. So I'm hoping our creatures are at least big enough to trade with his, and then we have a better time recurring them than he does. Hopefully slowly winning us the game in that aspect. And then finally we have uh, Bilal's Obeka deck. 
I'm not 100% sure what his, this deck is all about. He mentioned that he took apart his Nekusar deck and kind of turned it into Obeka, which is both good and bad, I think, because it means that, you know, Nekusar isn't leading the deck, which is good for the entire table. But it does mean that there's probably some scary things in there, so we'll have to see how that turns out. But I am looking forward to this game. I hope you guys are too. And we will see how it goes, and I'll talk to you guys after the game. At the start of the game, Jason goes first, followed by Sean, Bilal, and myself. On Jason's first turn, he plays an island. Sean plays a Thornwood Falls, gaining a life. Bilal plays a Prismatic Vista. I play a Temple of Malady, scrying one. Jason plays an island, and then casts Fog Bank. Sean plays a Tranquil Thicket, and at the end of turn, Bilal cracks Prismatic Vista to put a Swamp into play, and then on his turn, plays a Mountain. I play an Island and cast Demir Signet. Jason plays an Island. Sean plays a Lonely Sandbar. Bilal plays a Cascading Bluffs, and then casts the Royal Scions, before activating their plus one ability to draw a card and discard a card. This has him discarding Blightsteel Colossus and shuffling it back into his library. I play an island, and then cast Harrow, sacrificing an island to put two basic lands into play. In response, Jason cycles a Lonely Sandbar, and then I cast a Woe Strider, making a 0-1 goat token when it enters. Jason plays a Tectonic Edge, and then casts a Crown of Doom, giving all creatures that attack him plus 2 plus 0, and giving him the ability to give it to an opponent. Sean plays a Forest, and then casts Everflowing Chalice, kicked twice, so it taps for 2 mana. Bilal plays an Island, and casts Nicol Bolas the Ravager, making each opponent discard a card. He then activates the Scion's plus 1 ability to draw a card and discard a card. In Bilal's end step, I then sacrifice the goat to the Woe Strider, scrying one. On my turn, I cast Hunted Horror, giving Sean the two 3-3 Centaur tokens with protection from black, in the hopes that he'll attack the Royal Scions. I then cast a Thing in the Ice and pass. Jason plays an Island, and then activates Crown of Doom, giving it to Bilal. Sean casts a Trigon Predator and a Merileaf Pixie before attacking the Royal Scions for 10 thanks to the Crown of Doom, killing the Planeswalker. On Bilal's turn, he plays a Mountain and then activates the Crown of Doom, giving it to me. On my turn, I attack Sean for 7 with Hunted Horror, and then in my second main phase, I cast Forgotten Creation, which lets me discard my hand and draw cards equal to the number of cards discarded on each of my upkeeps. Jason plays an Island, and then casts Teferi Temporal Archmage, activating his plus one ability to look at the top two cards of his deck, putting one to hand and one on the bottom of his deck. Sean casts a Simic Ascendancy, which gets a counter on it whenever his creatures get plus one plus one counters, and wins him the game if it has 20 counters in his upkeep. Then he casts Primal Empathy, which draws him a card on upkeep if he has the biggest creature, or puts a 1-1 counter on something if he doesn't. He then attacks me for 4 with the Trigon Predator, since I have the Crown of Doom, and he destroys the crown when it deals combat damage. Bilal plays an Island, and casts Inferno Titan, doing 2 damage to Merrileaf Pixie, killing it, and 1 to Teferi. In my upkeep, I cast Putrefy to destroy Inferno Titan and put a counter on Thing in the Ice. Then Forgotten Creation triggers, and I discard my hand, drawing 1, and then drawing for turn. I then play a Forest, and attack Teferi for 7, killing the Planeswalker through the Fog Bank thanks to Trample. On Jason's turn, he plays an island, and then casts Concentrate to draw three cards. In Sean's upkeep, 
he casts Growth Spiral to draw a card and put a forest into play, and then Primal Empathy triggers, putting a plus one plus one counter on Trigon Predator and Simic Ascendancy. He then casts his commander, Tanazir Quandrix, doubling the counters on Trigon Predator and putting another counter on the Simic Ascendancy. On Bilal's turn, he cast Fevered Visions, which makes everyone draw a card in their end step and take two damage if they have four or more cards in hand. He then goes to his end step and draws a card. In my upkeep, I discard one card to Forgotten Creation, drawing one, and then cast my commander, Moldrotha the Gravetide. But unfortunately, Jason decides to counter it with Exclude. Once that resolves, I play a Forest, and then in my end step, I draw from Fevered Visions. On Jason's turn, he plays an Island, and then casts Sky Diamond. He then moves to end step, drawing a card and taking two from Fevered Visions. In Sean's untap step, before Primal Empathy can trigger, he activates Simic Ascendancy, putting a counter on Trigon Predator, and then casts Invigorating Surge to double the counters on the Predator, putting three counters on Ascendancy. This then lets him draw a card from the Primal Empathy, since he has the biggest creature on board. He also plays a Fabled Passage and cracks it for an island before passing. Bilal casts and kicks a Skyclave Relic, making two copies of it when it enters, then draws a card in his end step. In my upkeep, I discard two cards to Forgotten Creation, drawing two. I then play a Swamp and cast a Slum Reaper, making everyone sacrifice a creature. This winds up killing the Slum Reaper, Fog Bank, a Centaur Token, and Nicol Bolas. I then move to combat, attacking Bilal for 7, and Jason for 3. Then at the end of turn, I draw a card. Jason plays an island and casts Phyrexian Ingester, exiling the Trigon Predator and becoming a 10-11 creature. Then at the end of his turn, he draws a card and takes 2 damage. On Sean's turn, he casts Nature's Lore, putting a forest into play and then cast Growing Rites of Itlamok, putting a Hydroid Crassus to hand. At this point, we also remember Primal Empathy, and Sean puts a 1-1 counter on Tanazir, plus a counter on Simic Ascendancy. He then plays a Breeding Pool Tapped, and casts Return to Nature to exile Slum Reaper from my graveyard, and then draws a card at end step. Bilal plays a Crumbling Necropolis, before casting Balefire Dragon, followed up by a Fractured Power Stone, and then draws a card at the end of his turn. In my upkeep, I discard two cards to Forgotten Creation to draw two cards, and then recast Muldrotha, which allows me to play permanence from my graveyard, and then I play a Swamp from the graveyard, and I follow that up by casting Soul Ring from the graveyard as well. I then move to combat, attacking Jason for 3, since it's unblockable thanks to Skulk, and at the end of turn, I draw a card and take 2 damage. Jason plays an island, and casts Fool's Demise on the Balefire Dragon, making it so that when it dies, it returns to play under Jason's control. Then at the end of turn, Jason draws a card and takes 2. Sean, in his upkeep, puts a counter on Tanazir and the Simic Ascendancy thanks to Primal Empathy, and then casts a Hydroid Crassus for X equals 6, drawing 3 cards, gaining 3 life, and putting 6 counters on both the Crassus and the Ascendancy, putting the enchantment to 16. He also plays a Yavimaya Coast and casts Dragon's Guard Elite. Then at the end of turn, Sean's Growing Rites of Itlamok transforms into Itlamok, Cradle of the Sun, which taps for a green mana for each creature he controls, and then he draws a card and takes 2 damage. Bilal casts a Soul Ring, and then casts Nicol Bolas Planeswalker. In response, Sean casts Negate to counter the spell. Bilal then casts a Vampiric Tutor, searching his deck for a card, putting it on top, and losing 2 life. Then at the end step, he draws a card. In my upkeep, I discard 4 cards to Forgotten Creation, drawing 4 cards. I then play an Island from the Graveyard, followed up by a Seal of Primordium, which can be sacrificed to destroy an artifact or enchantment. 
I then also cast a Golgari Signet from the graveyard. And then I cast a Mask of Avacyn and move to equip it to Muldrotha, giving my commander plus one, plus two, and hexproof. I also cast Laboratory Drudge from the graveyard, which lets me draw a card at the end of turn if I've cast a spell from a graveyard this turn. And then in my end step, I draw two, thanks to the Drudge and Fevered Visions, taking two damage. Also, at the end of my turn, Jason sacrifices Tectonic Edge to destroy Sean's Itlamok. On Jason's turn, he casts Compulsive Research, drawing three cards and discarding a land. He then plays an island, and then casts a Morph, followed by an Assault Suit. Then at the end of his turn, he draws a card and takes two. Also at the end of his turn, I decide to sacrifice Seal of Primordium to destroy the Simic Ascendancy, keeping us all in the game. Sean plays a Hall of Oracles, and then attacks me with Hydroid Crassus and Tanazir, which makes the Crassus's base power equal to Tanazir's, so I take 18 total damage. Then, in his second main phase, he casts an Altered Ego, where X equals 5, to copy the Balefire Dragon and put 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. Then at the end of turn, Sean draws a card for Fevered Visions, taking 2. Bilal plays a Swamp, and then casts Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger, exiling Altered Ego and Hydroid Crassus. In response, Sean casts Snakeskin Veil to give the Crassus Hexproof and an additional plus one plus one counter, and he also casts Essence Capture to counter the Ulamog, putting another counter on Tanazir. Bilal then casts his commander, Obeka, Brute Chronologist, before attacking Sean for six with Balefire Dragon, doing six to all his creatures when it deals combat damage. This kills his Centaur token and the Dragon's Guard Elite. Then at the end of turn, Bilal draws a card. In my upkeep, I discard five cards to Forgotten Creation, drawing five. Then I play a Forest from my graveyard and cast Rampant Growth, putting a land from my library into play and removing a counter from Thing in the Ice. I follow that up with Kodama's Reach, searching for one land to put into play and another to my hand, removing another counter from Thing in the Ice. And then I cast a Chasm Skulker from the Graveyard. I follow that up by casting a Seal of Doom, which can be sacrificed to destroy a non-black creature. And then I cast Spellskite, which allows me to redirect any spell or ability to target Spellskite instead of any other creature. I then move to combat, attacking Jason for 3 and Bilal for 7. Then at the end of my turn, I draw a card and take two damage. Jason plays an island, equips Assault Suit to the Phyrexian and Jester, then moves to end step, drawing a card and taking two. In Sean's upkeep, he puts a counter on Tanazir with Primal Empathy, then plays an island, and casts Orin Reef Ooze, putting another counter on Tanazir, before attacking Bilal for 23 total damage, knocking him out of the game. Then, in Sean's second main phase, he casts a Galloping Lizrog, removing 5 counters from Tanazir and putting 10 on the Lizrog. In my upkeep, with the Forgotten Creation trigger on the stack, I cast Poison the Cup to transform Thing in the Ice, returning all non-horror creatures to their owner's hands. In response, Jason flips up his Morph, Riptide Survivor, to discard 2 cards and draw 3. After that, the board wipe resolves, and I discard six cards to Forgotten Creation to draw six, returning Muldrotha to the command zone and putting seven total counters on Chasm Skulker. I then move to combat, attacking Jason for 22 and Sean for nine. However, before the damage, Jason casts into the Royal to return Chasm Skulker to my hand. However, in response to that, I sacrifice the Chasm Skulker with Woe Strider, scrying one and making seven 1-1 one, one squid tokens with Island Walk. 
Jason then casts Turn to Frog to turn my Awoken Horror into a 1-1 frog with no abilities, so instead I activate Spellskite, turning it into a frog instead. Undeterred and still not out of removal, Jason casts Pongify to destroy my Awoken Horror, giving me a 3-3 Ape token, and then Jason winds up taking 7 damage, and Sean takes 9. In my second main phase, I play a Swamp, and then recast Muldrotha, equipping it with the Mask of Avacyn. On Jason's turn, he plays an Island, and then evokes a Muldrifter to draw two cards, before casting a Breaching Leviathan. This allows him to tap all non-blue creatures, making it so they can't untap on their controller's next untap step. On Sean's turn, he casts Hydroid Crassus where X equals 10, putting 10 counters on it, gaining 5 life and drawing 5 cards. He then plays a forest and casts Lanoir Elves. At the end of turn, I sacrifice my Seal of Doom to destroy the Hydroid Crassus. In my upkeep, I discard 7 cards to Forgotten Creation, drawing 7. I then play an island out of the graveyard, and cast Seal of Doom from the graveyard again, followed up by Seal of Removal, which lets me bounce a non-creature permanent. I then cast a Mage Hunter from the graveyard, which does 1 damage to an opponent when they cast or copy an instant or sorcery and I sacrifice Seal of Removal to return Lanoir Elves to Sean's hand before attacking him with everything for exactly 20 damage, knocking him out of the game. Then, in my second main phase, I cast my own arch nemesis, Sporefrog. On Jason's turn, he casts Distorting Wake, where X equals 6, to return 6 of my creatures to my hand, and in response, I cast Perplex to counter the spell, unless Jason discards his hand. In an attempt to stay in the game, Jason casts a Dismiss to counter the Perplex. However, once that resolves, I cast a Drown in the Lock to again try to counter the Distorting Wake, this time succeeding. This leaves Jason wide open to the attack on my turn, so he decides to concede, winning me the game. Alright, so that was a sweet game. I'm really happy with how this deck performed. I think we got to see some awesome cards definitely pull their weight in this deck. Forgotten Creation was undoubtedly the MVP for us. Being able to wheel our hands every single turn for, I think, about seven or eight turns it stuck around. It was there for a long time. Really got us to have... A great game by the end of it. Muldrotha being able to stay alive for most of it definitely helped us play out our hand, play out our graveyard. We got to flip a thing in the ice, which I was really happy about because it was the only main horror tribal card in there. So overall, very happy with the deck. Uh, we didn't see Cursed Monstrosity, unfortunately. I think it would have actually been pretty good being able to have a 4-3 flyer on board. And I think uh, Bilal's deck didn't quite do as much as it wanted. We weren't able to see a lot of what was happening, but I do think it was a Planeswalker deck, and he made some enemies with Sean pretty early on, uh, thanks to the killing of his Planeswalkers, but Sean's deck did what it meant to do, dropped some massive creatures. He almost got the win with Simic Ascendancy. Uh, I actually wheeled into the removal spell for it right that turn with Forgotten Creation, so that was almost a non-game right there. And then Jason's uh, Teferi deck did very well, uh, surprisingly controlling, all things considered, considering it was a pre-constructed deck, but I think all the decks did very well, but I am very pleased with our Horror Tribal deck, and hopefully in the future, if you guys have any suggestions for future decks, please let me know. Uh, put them in the comments below. You can follow me on Twitter. That's in the description as well. Let me know there. You can always send me an email also in the description. I'm happy to hear from you if you have any suggestions for future videos. Otherwise, please like the video. Uh, subscribe if you're interested in more. We do videos like this every single Friday. And... 
I look forward to reading all the comments and hearing any suggestions. But otherwise, I will see you all on the other side of the Dungeon Learner's Guide.